Um, welcome to Fluke Hall. I see actually a fair number of new faces that I haven't seen before. That's really exciting. Um, we do this uh, typically every week during the school year. We take some time off for finals and, uh, and any kind of breaks because the students aren't here and this is part of what we do is we educate our startups and we educate the students and then we also open this up to the public because we want everybody thinking about innovation and thinking. We want everybody feeling like they can start their own startup in Seattle, one of the most startup friendly cities in the world. Um, things that are coming up. Next Thursday, the 12th, uh, by the way, this is all simulcast to Spokane and it's also just on the internet for anybody to watch. Um, so this is for those folks out on the line in Spokane. Founders Pitch Founders will be happening next Thursday the 12th at the Spokane Center at 4 p.m. So that's something for y'all on the east side to look for. Uh, next week in this space, we'll be having Carly Price speak about Startup Finance 101. She's pretty amazing. She's a really good speaker. She spent 18 years on Wall Street and then in 2012 caught the startup bug, became a founder. And since then, she's done a dozen seed financings, either as a founder or on the other side of the table as working as an as a angel investor um, and kind of a deal maker. So she is pretty amazing. Uh, she's an avowed numbers nerd, from what I understand. And that will be followed by uh, the entrepreneur a little boo -boo, wow. entrepreneurial law clinic will be here talking about patents 101. Uh, for those who don't know, we're starting uh, what is IP today. Um, the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic is part of the University of Washington School of Law and they do legal presentations after our fundamentals presentations and the IP presentations are one of the most popular presentations that they give. They're really informative and really interesting so please stick around for that. So that next week will be Patents 101 and today after Donna we'll be doing uh, um, What is IP? So, and then one other event coming up Tuesday the 17th, we'll be starting back up our Blockchain Basics class over at um, CoMotion Labs at HQ, which is 4545 Roosevelt Way Northeast, right over by the Trader Joe's, for those of you who know the area. Um, that one is going to be John Seacrest, our own John Seacrest from the Seattle area, is going to be leading a panel discussion on um, business models for blockchain. So today I'm super excited and actually oh, pretty nervous to introduce one of my co-workers. Uh, <laughs> Donna O'Neill works with CoMotion. She, um, she is, has over 25 years in marketing and communications experience. She brings a wealth of knowledge in strategic communications, storytelling, media relations, and marketing. And I didn't even know this, but now I know that most recently she was vice president at Wagner Edstrom Communications where she worked with Microsoft and she led their commercial analyst relations team and she led the communications team representing Caradigm. Uh, that's the joint venture between Microsoft and GE Healthcare. And so she has, uh, and she's also prior to that led the Microsoft Health Solutions Group. So she's had all of this experience in uh, finance, in healthcare, in high tech, and really excited to have her speaking about marketing with us today. So we'll hear Marketing Your Startup with Donna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate that. Thank you all for coming today. So glad you could join us. As she said, I'm Donna O'Neill, and I lead marketing and communications for Commotion and the Global Innovation Exchange, which is over in Bellevue. And for a quick aside, could you please let me know with a show of hands if you've ever heard of a Global Innovation Exchange? Two, three. Okay, we clearly have more work to do. <laughs> But um, it just opened up last September, and so the efforts are just starting there. So um, I spend half my time on that and half my time on Commotion and Commotion Labs marketing communications. So um, the other thing I wanted to do before we get started, come on in, is to get with a show of hands how many of you, um, are where you are in your startup journey. Um, it'll just help me tailor my comments a little bit more. So I would just love to have an idea of if you are not doing a startup yet, but you have an idea, but haven't yet started, raise your hand. Okay, couple. Okay, what about folks who have started working, but it's, it's still part-time, it's not a full-time job yet? Okay, a few more. And then how many of you are maybe in year one or year two of your startup? All right, a little bit more. Anybody three or more years into their startup? 
Okay. All right. That, that's helpful. Thank you. It'll help me tailor my remarks. So um, today, as we, we said, I'm going to talk about marketing and communications. And um, there's so many different things we can do in marketing today. And we're going to spend time talking about all the different channels and all the different ways that you can um, leverage and get, get your uh, communications message out and have your voice heard about your company. Next slide. <laughs> do you click the slides or do I? Oh, want me to grab? Oh, I got it. That's okay. Okay, so the first slide. Um, always start with your goals. So the whole point of any kind of marketing um, and communications plan is to really start with the business goals. So go back to the, the goals that you created in your business plan and all of your marketing go goals should really map up to that. That way anything you do is always going to uh, map back to what really your North Star is and will make sure that you're making sense with any of the activities and efforts that you choose. Um, your marketing goals, just to give you an idea of some types of marketing goals, just if you have not created them before, it could be things like building brand awareness. It can be things like launching a new product or service. Um, it could be targeting new customers if there's a new customer segment that you would like to go after. Um, it really can be any number of things. It really just depends on what the goals of your company are and where you are in your startup journey. The next thing is really um, knowing your target audience. And that sounds a little easier than it is. It does take some research and effort to find out who your target audience is. But I think you'll find that any of the, the efforts that you do and the research that you do to find out who they are is really going to make your marketing efforts much more valuable. You're going to have a much higher return on investment if you do that. So spending time on deciding am I, am I going after customers, am I going after investors, um, am I going after fellow scientists or, or doctors, um, is it the general public, and it might be all of them. Um, I know in most of the work I do I've seemed to have you know five or six or seven target audiences and so then what you really need to do is rank them and just get really ruthless about which are your most important and try to put at the very top the ones that you really feel are going to influence uh, your company the most and who have the, who have the most um, to gain by hearing about your product. So um, in terms of ranking them, you can ask yourself things like, who is most likely to use my product? Um, who is most likely to be interested in the values and um, that the product or, or service offers? Um, for similar products, maybe there's other products already on the market that are similar to the one you're doing. Um, what demographic groups are buying those products? When do they buy them? And lastly, this is one of my favorites, you know, ask your family and friends. I mean, you don't have to pay, you know, big research uh, bucks to get some of this information. Just asking your family and friends, hey, would you purchase this product or service that I'm creating? Would you use this? Do you have a need for this product? Or do you know someone who does have a need for this product? So, you know, don't be afraid to do some of your own uh, informal auditing and your own informal research to to make sure that you're on the right track. The next thing to look at is really choosing your channels and of course we have more channels today than we've ever had and so this can be a little overwhelming at first because there's so many different you know ways you can go um, but the important thing to understand is once you pick your target audience, you really need to understand where it is that they get their information. And again, this will be different for each of your startups. Um, you know, you, you, again, you can do some of your own informal auditing with some of the people that you know would be interested in your product. Where do they get their information? What are they reading? What magazines or periodicals or publications are they reading? What websites are they going to? Um, what are the topics they're covering in their social media channels? So the more you can learn about your target audience and where they get your inform their information, the better targeted your efforts will be. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about that last uh, bullet, the earned, owned, and paid. How many have heard, you got, have heard those phrases, those words? 
so a, a few. They're very common in the marketing communications world. So I just thought I would share them with you in case you come across them so you know what they are. So earned is when you earn your own media coverage through your own efforts, reaching out to editors and reporters, and any media coverage you get that's considered earned. So that's, that's one channel. Um, the second is owned, and so that's anything you do on your own. Any blogs you might post, social media postings you may do, uh, any other articles you may write and put up on LinkedIn, that's all stuff that you do on your own. So that's owned. And then the third channel, of course, is paid, and that's any kind of paid online advertising with you know, Google advertising, Facebook advertising, uh, more traditional types of advertising. But um, those are kind of the three main channels we look at when we're looking at our different opportunities. Next, we're going to look at branding, one of my favorites. Um, so this is something you know that you should probably think about pretty early on, and this could also include coming up with the name of your startup, even something as simple as that, um, but then also having a consistent look and feel for it. And so typically this would mean you know looking at um, things like a logo and what kind of logo or a word mark that you might want to create for the name of your company. Um, it could look at choosing styles of images and, and photos so that you have a consistent look and feel. Um, and, it and then you could also create guidelines so that you know whether it's on your website or it's in print material or on social media. Your logo's always there. You're using the same fonts, the same colors. The bottom line is you want anyone to know whenever they come to any, um, any channel of yours that they'll feel like it's from the same company. So everything you create has to look and feel the same. That's that re repetition that's going to get people to start recognizing who you are and be able to say, oh, that's from that company, or, you know, and they start recognizing um, those things. Um, one of the things I was going to share about branding is um, UW does quite a bit of branding, as you may have noticed. They have very specific fonts and colors and logos that they're very strict about using, and they have a whole website that is open to the public. So I just thought I would share that with you guys if you want to get a sense for what a full-blown uh, branding uh, campaign looks like. So it's on um, the UW website. It's very straightforward. It's just uw.edu slash brand. And if you go up there, you'll see everything from fonts to templates to logos to photography, um, all different ways that they give very specific guidelines about how to use their branding. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, everybody. So um, hold them until we're done, and then we'll, we'll have plenty of time for that. Um, the next slide is creating compelling content. So this is probably where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time today because it is such an important piece of what you do in your marketing and your communications program. So um, have you guys ever heard the quote from Mark Twain? It's one of my favorites. If I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. <laughs> and you know, the whole point of that, as we all know, it's, very, it's much harder to be concise and to be clear and to be brief than it is to just you know, write without a lot of thought given to it. So really, they call it the three C's of communications are clear, compelling, and consistent. And those are kind of the, um, you know, the values that you want to go by when you're creating all of your communications. Now, related to this is things like I, you see up here a tagline, your elevator pitch, a five minute pitch, and your key messages. Again, I could do a whole presentation just on this one slide. <laughs> but um, you know, ha having a tagline that is compelling, maybe three to five words, very brief, but gives a very quick ex explanation of what you do so that anybody, again, seeing you on the website or on, on social media, you can very quickly you know, get an idea of what this company does. And hopefully, it shows your unique value proposition as compared to potential competitors. Um, the elevator pitch, I'm not going to go into that too much now because that literally is a whole separate presentation. But I did put some slides at the end here, if anybody is interested in having the deck that has five or six slides on what an elevator pitch looks like. 
I mean, literally, like what each slide should be. It's about 10 slides, and it tells you what to put on each slide. So if you do want more information about that, happy to share that. And, and that really um, is something that you would use over and over when you're talking to friends and family, when you're talking to potential investors, when you're talking to potential customers. You've got to have your you know, 30 second pitch down. You've got to have like a five minute pitch down. So there's you know, different lengths of pitches that you really should just have down and ready to go so that whenever you have that opportunity to talk to somebody about your company, uh, you make sure you're making the most compelling points possible. The last bullet there, key messaging and benefits. Um, again, that can be a whole separate exercise called a messaging framework. There are big companies that spend a lot of time and effort on these, and Microsoft and others uh, put a lot of research into them and a lot of user feedback. So this could be a whole exercise in and of itself. But it is important, I think, that uh, you know, at least for a startup's purposes, you know what are your three key messages whenever you're going in to talk again to an investor. And these certainly tie into your elevator pitch. But to keep those three key messages top of mind, and they're typically benefit-oriented, you know, what is, what is your unique value proposition? What is your company going to do that others are not doing? And to really get to that benefit statement, not just the features and functionality of it, but how is it really going to change people's lives? How is it going to improve people's lives? Um, to really make it meaningful to have them even think, why should I care? Why should I even care to hear your pitch? So the more you can get to that essence, the, the better off you're going to be. The next slide is on the importance of storytelling. And I feel like this is becoming pretty common knowledge out there now. So. You know, forgive me if you guys have already heard some of this, but I did just want to make sure I'm reiterating the importance of it. Because even business professionals I work with today who, you know, are very savvy and knowledgeable still tend to go to features and functionality and data points rather than telling a story. And I cannot, if there's one thing you remember today from my talk, it would be the importance of storytelling. Because research has shown, and I'm going to share some data points with you from a neuroscientist, that it literally does enable people to remember what you're saying better and to have a real emotional connection to it and really care about what you're doing. And so if you don't do it that way, they're not going to have as much of a connection or really care as much about what you're doing. So one of the things I wanted to share was um, a, a great article I found in Harvard Business Review by a neuroscientist named Paul Zak. And he did some experiments and he wrote a story called Why Your Brain Loves Good Storytelling. And it literally is a brain thing. So um, he, just to quote him, he said, experiments show that character-driven stories with emotional content result in a better understanding of the key points a speaker wishes to make and enables them to better recall these points weeks later. So again, just shows you the power of, of, of storytelling. Um, and when you think about storytelling for your own startup, you need to think about some of the things I mentioned a little bit earlier. Why should a customer or person even care about what you're doing? How is it going to change or improve lives? Um, how will people feel when it's completed? You know, these are really the components of what you're trying to get at when you're trying to figure out what is your compelling story that you want to tell. And then also don't forget one of the really compelling stories you can tell is how your startup came to be in the first place. Everybody has their own origin story and um, it's a great way to start a conversation. It gets people pulled into what it is that made you passionate about what you want to do. And so, um, you know, really kind of having them understand where did that passion come from? Why are you risking, you know, health and wealth and, and all the things you might be risking to do a startup? Um, you know, why did you why did you choose to do this? And what barriers did you have to overcome? People love stories of, um, you know, problems that you've encountered along the way and how you've overcome them. So that's kind of a classic storyline as well that people really connect to. Um, so think about that also when you're thinking about your storytelling. Um, the last point on this slide I wanted to talk about was the power of three. Have you guys heard about the power of three? OK. 
Okay, some. Um, so this is again a very uh, communications focused principle, but you see it in literature, you see it in storytelling, you see it in advertising, um, you see it really all over. Once you start learning about it, you're going to see it all over the place now and you're probably going to you know, be mad that I told you about it because it's going to drive you crazy. <laughs> but um, the three, the power of threes is that it's really um, one of those universal truths <laughs> that really stick with people. So having, and the reason it, it, it's three is because it combines both brevity and rhythm with having the smallest amount of information, but it creates a pattern. So I know it's a lot of words there, but it, that's why it's three that really rings true with people. So, um, <laughs> You might ask, well, how can I apply the power of three to what I'm doing? It kind of goes, one of the things is the three key messages I told you about before. Keep it to three, not five, not six. Keep it to three, and it's more likely to be remembered. Um, also, in your PR efforts, when you get the opportunity to talk to media and press, go into the interview thinking about what are the three key things I want to say to this guy. It might be your three key messages, but it might be something more specific to what this article is about. But always go into that with the three things in your mind. When I used to um, consult with Microsoft executives before they would go into meetings with the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, you know, I would always you know, prompt them and tell them, okay, what are the three things you're going to tell them? What are, you know, and, and it's just a great reminder so that no matter what questions they ask you, because they will try to pull you in the direction they want to go, that you can at least weave these three key things into your answers no matter what they ask you. And there are little tips and tricks, and I, again, I could do a whole other session on that, on you know, um, spokesperson tips for speaking with the media. But there are ways that you can make a bridge to like, oh, that's a great question, but what's really important is this. <laughs> so you can acknowledge the question, but then bridge over to what are those really key points you're trying to say. So there's a few different techniques like that that you can use when, when talking to the media. Okay, now we're going to do a fun little exercise. So um, here are some famous threes, and you guys let me know. Tell me if you recognize them or where they may have come from. Some are harder than others. Stop, look, and listen. Yes, who was that? Yes, it was, it was a um, pedestrian campaign. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think most people know that one. Blood, sweat, and tears. And it's a rock band from the 70s. <laughs> um, faster, higher, stronger. Olympics. I forgot that one too. Um, don't be evil. Google. Outwit, outplay, outlast. Yes, yeah. <laughs> survivor. I knew that because my kids love it. Um, just do it. Everybody knows that one. I'm loving it. McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> and last one, finger licking good. Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so, I mean, we're having a little fun with it, but it's just to show you, you know, we remember these things and they kind of stick. So, it's there that the power of threes is in those, those words as well. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on social media since it's such an important part of most of, I would assume, most of what you all are going to do. Um, how many of you have already created social media accounts for your startup? Okay, a few. Um, I would argue that that's probably one of the early things you're going to want to do as you get your startup off the ground. And I was going to share a few tips with you as you get that started. And even though for people who have started it, I think these tips will be helpful to help grow your following. Um, so the first is follow others with similar interests. Um, and you know that's just a great way to get yourself involved with other thought leaders in the space, connect with them. You can use their handle to actually you know, kind of talk to them and hopefully they will follow you back. Um, so it's just a way to get yourself involved in those larger conversations. Um, you can also ask your followers to retweet. I would use this sparingly. I mean, you don't want to ask everybody to retweet, but especially if something is particularly compelling and you really think a particular tweet is really important, you can ask people to retweet and they, they will do that at times. 
Um, leverage and optimize hashtags. So there's a whole bunch of research on that you can do on hashtags and you can find out which are most uh, used, which are most relevant to your space. So I would encourage you to do some of that research. It's you know, pretty straightforward. Just kind of click, you know, type in different hashtags, see what kind of posts come up, see if it's relevant to the work that you're doing. Is that a hashtag that you want to be involved in? Or conversely, you can create your own hashtag. Um, for UW, for example, we created a hashtag, hashtag called UW Innovates. And that was kind of created by Central Marketing, I think a couple of years ago, maybe further back. It was before my time. And so we will use that in our um, tweets whenever it makes sense, again, to tie into that broader UW innovation theme. And so, you know, you might want to have your own hashtag that, that you think um, is relevant to your space, or you might want to, to tie into others so that you're, part of, again, part of those larger conversations. Um, other things you can li link to influencers, that's sort of similar to the first one, and let them know about it. As I said, you can use their handle so that you can, they can see that you're talking about them. And you can share an article of interest. You can comment on an article and, and say that you thought it was a great article for these reasons, put the author's name on it, have him see that you are, are, are tweeting about it. And you know, people are open to flattery. You know, they like the fact that someone has commented on their article and they will oftentimes follow you back. And then last, vary up the type of content that you share. That can help increase your following as well. So you don't want to just retweet articles all the time. You might want to share quotes. You might want to tweet at a uh, live tweet at an event. You might want to share some news or milestones. You might just want to share something fun that you're, being, you're involved in with your company. So anything you can do to vary up the content is really helpful. Um, this was a question I got from Elizabeth Scallon, who, <laughs> who heads up Commotion Labs. When do you hire a marketing person? So it, it is true that some of this work I'm talking about you can do on your own with a little bit of you know education or a little bit of help maybe from friends or family. There are probably some things you are going to want to hire a marketing professional for. And um, you know I would choose a vendor or a contractor that really caters to startups so that they have a lower per hour you know, billing rate, um, and they've done other work with startups, so they might be a little bit more nimble and, and have an idea of what you're looking for. Um, so I, I would say things like messaging, while you can do that yourself, it's great to get feedback on it. It doesn't have to be with a professional, but it's great to get feedback from other people in your industry, from people at Commotion Labs you know, who do this kind of work. Um, you probably would want to hire someone for logo creation and visual identity. And again, there are people who kind of focus on startups who, who will not charge you an arm and a leg like some of the you know, higher end um, companies will. And we've got actually some contacts and resources there if you guys are interested and in, in who that might be and, and some of the people that we've worked with to do that. Video creation is another one that, you know, again, you can do it on your own. Might not come out that well, depending on, on your skill level. Um, but again, there are people that you can hire who would be willing to charge a lower rate, who um, you know, are just maybe new to the business, trying to build their resume, and you would still get a really nice quality of, of work. So um, I think that's, that's another one. And then writing and blogging. Again, you can do your own writing. It depends on your own writing skills. Um, but you can also hire a writer to write a blog a month or a week or whatever it is you want to do. And again, you could find some either students or people just starting out who might be happy to work with you and, and you know, not charge you too much for that. Uh, another question we get is, how much buzz does a startup need to get investors? So um, this is you know, a little bit subjective. It's a little bit different for every company. But I think I would say, in general, if you can generate some media coverage, have an article or two that you can show people, whether it's in GeekWire. GeekWire is a great one, by the way. And I've got some great contacts there if I can you know, be of assistance. But um, you know, they're pretty great at covering startups and innovations, and, and especially in the UW community. So even having an article by them, you know, I think legitimizes you, gives you a little bit more credibility. And um, so I think that's something I would, I would really try to, to, to land. Um, having press releases, and they kind of look very official. You can put them up on your websites. Um, it, it just, I think, again, lends, lends a certain amount of credibility to your effort and um, you know, that might not otherwise be there. So I would consider using the press release format. 
Um, participation in events and conferences. This is a great way to really um, get yourself out there, get yourself to be part of the community, whether that's at a booth or tabling at different events, um, being a, offering yourself as a speaker on a particular expert topic. Um, so anything to get you out you know, in the mainstream and to be getting visibility is gonna help in your efforts to attract investors. Um, exposure to VCs and angels, if there's any other networking or, or, or meetings like this that you can go to where you can network with VCs and angels, that's a great way to get those connections started. And what we've talked about, the social media presence, you know, having a social media presence that you can point people to, that they can follow you on, again, I think lends that credibility and legitimacy that, that you're going to want. And then a little bit more about PR in particular for, for startups. Um, I would really encourage you to write press releases when you hit particular milestones. So if you got a new customer or you uh, were just licensed or you got some new funding, any, any milestone that you hit along the way, if you can have a press release that you can send out to some of the local media, that's a great way to get um, some potential coverage. Um, also researching which reporters follow your space. So reporters typically have a, a particular beat that they follow, whether it's healthcare or technology. And the more you can really target your efforts to the reporter that cares about your space, the, the higher your chance of getting some coverage. Some people don't do that and they just kind of randomly send things and you're not gonna get um, very good results. But if you put a little bit of research in and figure out who is the guy or who's the you know, man or woman who you can really target, you're gonna have better results. Um, another way to kind of start developing relationships with local media is to uh, get in touch with them over email and do a little bit of a pitch over email about who you are and what your expertise is and offer just to have coffee with them. You don't even have to go to them with a particular story in mind. It could just be more like, hey, I wanted to let you know about what I'm doing and then offer yourself up as an expert who could be a resource for a future story that this reporter is working on. So if there's a way that you can do something for them, then maybe they can do something for you down the road. But it, it's a nice way to, um, you know, it's a, it's a warm introduction kind of to, to kind of get that relationship going. Because a lot of media relations is based on relationships and them knowing you and feeling like you have credibility and that you are an expert in your space. They're always looking for experts and resources that they can call to give them quick quotes for a particular article they're working on. So the more you can do to let them know that, hey, you're someone who can be available quickly, and that's the key, you gotta be available very quickly because often they're on deadlines and they will basically take the quote from the first person who returns their call. So if you're able to you know, turn it around that quickly, you could be the one that ends up getting the quote in the article. Um, and then pitch, pitch mails. There's kind of a, an art to, to a good pitch mail. Um, you can just send a press release, but sometimes the press release doesn't really tell the story. The press release might be more about the facts because that's typically what press releases are, more about who, what, where, when, why, just the facts, ma'am. Um, but your pitch mail should be a little bit more enticing to them, a little bit more background, probably a little bit of the storytelling to try to get them more hooked in why should I care about writing this story. And it shouldn't be more than a screen of mail. These guys get hundreds of pitch mails a day. So you're trying to differentiate yours and make yours stand out a little bit. Um, also, if you can do some of the work with them up front, if you have a quote or two from a third party, if you have a customer who's willing to talk, all the better. Because then you're already helping them do some of the work that they would have to do on their own. So you're really serving it up to them nice and easy and it's a better chance of them covering your story. So I just wanted to end this portion of the talk with what I think of as the, sort of the action plan if you're just getting started and you want to know, okay, what should I do first and what are the most important things. And you don't have to do everything right away, but I think there's a few key things you need to do to get yourself started that are really, I would consider, table stakes to be in the startup game. So the first one is messaging. Make sure your messaging, that you've done some work on your messaging and, and um, that you feel good about what those three key benefits are and that they're really resonating with people. Um, second is branding, as we've talked about. You really need to get your, your name, your logo, your visual identity going, because that's gonna go up on any other anything else you create in terms of social media, websites, et cetera. Website, gotta do it. Um, even if it's just a few pages, you have to have that website presence. 
Short videos we haven't talked too much about, but videos are really critical. Um, even if it's just, and not even, I would recommend like 30 seconds, one minute. Does not have to, shouldn't be long, because people aren't going to watch a long video. But if you could have a quick video that in a compelling way shares your story that you can put up on your website and you can share over social media, it, you're going to get a lot more eyeballs. Um, I did a story last week with the Seattle Times. Um, it was a sponsored story for the Global Innovation Exchange, and we included one of our videos in the story. And really interesting to see the video got many more clicks than any other part of the story or any of the other ad banners around it. So, you know, we just know, and there's research that shows videos are very compelling to people. That's what they want to see. Rather than reading a whole, you know, page of text, they want to click on a video, and in 30 seconds, you got the gist of what this person's doing. So, I would recommend putting resources into that pretty early on um, so that it's something you can share very easily with people. Um, social media we've already talked about. Blogs that you can turn into e-newsletters. This has been really successful for us with Comotion and with GIX. So we've recently, in the last year or two, started a blog. We try to post at least once a week, maybe more. And then you can just package that up into a nice e-newsletter over MailChimp or any other type of um, software like that. And, and you can send it out to your mailing list, which hopefully will grow over time as you're out and about doing your different activities or as you are um, having your website and social media out there. Hopefully you will have people who will say, yes, I want to be on your mailing list. Well, this is a great way to push you know, your, your content to them. And it's really reusing content you've already created. So. Um, I would recommend this, this type of a strategy, you know, if you're at the point where um, you're ready to, to tell some of those stories. Um, we haven't talked about online advertising too much, um, but I did want to say that, we, and Gretchen's going to join me in a few minutes, but um, we've had some really good luck with Facebook and Google online advertising. It's really very inexpensive, it's very targeted. And for you know, a pretty small amount of money, you can kind of get your name out there. For we've done it for different events, um, for different brand awareness building. Um, so that's something you could consider as well. Uh, it's not something you necessarily need to do early on, but you might want to do as you start getting your name out there more. Um, some, and I think conferences, events, giveaways, that again might be a little bit after you, you get these other things done. But um, I would encourage you to do those sooner rather than later, again, to get yourself into that um, innovation ecosystem community. Um, <laughs> I, know I said even business cards. I was thinking about your Catalyst business cards. You, know, you can get creative as something as simple as a business card. Um, Gretchen did these really fun business cards with um, pictures of each of our An Amazon Catalyst fellows and the project that they won the, the award for. So it was just a kind of quick way for someone to you know, slip in their pocket, has the contact information on it too. Um, you know, so you can get creative with the types of things you do. You don't have to just you know, do the things I've said here. You may have other ideas or you may think of other things that your audiences would find compelling and, and ways to get your message out. So be creative. And then these are the other slides. I'm just going to quickly go through these to show you um, the types of things that you would want to think about for an elevator pitch. And again, I'm happy to share this deck with you. It talks about the content of an elevator pitch, the elements of a winning story, some of the pitfalls of it. The contents of the elevator pitch, the elements of the elevator pitch, and I guess I think that's it. So um, I thought I'd have Gretchen come up and join me, and we're happy to answer any questions you guys have and brainstorm with you if you'd like, whatever you think would be helpful. This is Gretchen Musgrove. She is my colleague over at Comotion, and she works on mostly Amazon Catalyst, but also some of the Comotion Labs communications and marketing. So, welcome, Gretchen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, who has some questions for us? So, I've answered everything. Now you guys know <laughs> everything. How to do your marketing? You're going to off and run. Here. Oh, Gaya has a question. Yes. Yeah. Hello. We'll get to. Can can you? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so Gretchen, maybe uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Amazon Catalyst program, like what it is, and what are some of the most successful um, sort of marketing campaigns that oh. you've had? Wow. Thanks for asking a question <laughs> that's so targeted toward what I do. <laughs> I can answer this. 
Um, <laughs> sure. So, uh, in a nutshell, Amazon Catalyst is uh, essentially a grant program that is a partnership between Amazon and UW Comotion, and together um, they offer um, awards to students, faculty, and staff within the University of Washington community to pursue big ideas, big, novel, scalable, unique solutions to real problems. And so <clears throat> you can imagine that Amazon Catalyst receives a lot of really interesting submissions. Um, and uh, so it's also a really fun program to think about marketing for because because what we're looking for requires so much creativity from our target audience, we get to be kind of meet that creativity with the marketing. Would you say that? Yeah, totally. And uh, so I would say that um, something that a new tactic that we've tried this year is to, um, and I think everyone can kind of put this into practice for their own startup as well, is you need to think like a customer, think like one of your customers, in the same way that I think of our customers as potential applicants for Amazon Catalyst. So when I um, talk to the program team and I discover, hmm, there's a certain portion of the Amazon Catalyst application that most people have some trouble with. And in, in that case, it was the hypothetical press release. We needed the applicants to write a press release as part of their application. And so, essentially, you look at what your customers have a potential pitfall with or trouble with in regards to your service, and then you can create some sort of marketing or slash assistance to help those customers or clients be successful, use your product successfully. So. Um, we hosted an application workshop that essentially taught people how to improve that part of their application. And we saw it as adding value to applicants um, in that knowing how to pitch yourself in something like a press release is important to know whether you receive a grant or not, right? You're adding value to their experience and at the same time you're helping them um, prepare to be a more successful candidate. Um, so I thought that that was kind of a fun and um, kind of value add way to think about marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, 25 years ago, there was a lot of print media, so that was very targeted. You could, for a particular industry, you could drop uh, you know, an advertisement in a magazine or something else like that. Mm -hmm. um, how do we find those these days? I'm, you know, I'm thinking about like, you know, there are magazines for health clubs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Where do we find that in the digital domain these days? Mm -hmm. um, good question. We have, um, well, we have a service, I'm thinking about, uh, called Meltwater. It's a database that we subscribe to and we can do searches on um, publications by topic area. Um, and so that's a way for us as marketers to find those. If you're just, you know, on your own, um, a lot of them are online and you could just do a search for, you know, top healthcare newsletters or top uh, medical newsletters um, and find some that way that you can then, um, you know, work with. But even better is probably asking people, you know, in the field. So if you know that there are doctors or whatever audience you're trying to go after, hey, what are the online publications that you read? What are online newsletters that you read that you may never have heard of, but that they find very valuable? Um, you know, that's, I would say that's probably the best way to go because you want to find out from the people themselves, you know, which publications do they find compelling. But they're, they're still around, even though it's, you know, maybe they're not in print, they're online. There are still publications for every field imaginable. You know, trucking, transportation, nursing, <laughs> pharmacy, you know, they all still have their own um, targeted publications that they send out to their people in that area. I would also hit the library for stuff like that, mm -hmm. based on magazines there. Yes, yep, yep, library is a great place. And a good place. librarian, too. Uh, yes, yep. Uh, hi, I um, just want to ask a question about the pitch. Uh, obviously, uh, your customers, your investors, 
and journalists, they have different perspective.、Mm -hmm. Do you、uh, recommend creating different pitches for different target groups?、Mm -hmm. And sh can you share any experience on that? Uh, yes, I do. Like, if you're going to pitch to investors, I would follow. Oh, I don't know how to get back to this now. <coughs> Excuse me.、Um, I'm trying to get back to the slides that talk about the pitch deck. Yeah, here it is. I think. So this one is very focused on investors, and it talks about the opportunity, the market segment, customers. So this is very targeted to investors. But for the media, this might not be the right story. You kind of have to decide what is that story you want to tell to the media,、um, and it might be how you came to be. You know, what is your origin story? It might be your aspirations for the future, how you want to change people's lives. So, while I still recommend having that storytelling be a part of this as well, I think you always want to you know, have that emotional connection. <coughs> Um, you're right. There are going to be different pitches you're going to need for different、um, circumstances.、Okay. So you really have to create at least three pitches. <laughs>、um, probably, yeah. One for investors. You know, maybe one for other、um, people, potential customers, and then maybe one for media. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs>、um, so you said something about. Uh, what is the benefit? But then you use the word feature also in your、mm -hmm. pitch. And I went to a class recently, the other day, and this lady said, "Don't write. Don't talk about your features. Talk about、That's、your、right. benefits."、That's、so、right. is that? Yeah, I didn't、okay. mean talk about. I'm saying some people talk about features and functionality, and no, I would not recommend that. So benefit. Ben it's all about the benefit. Okay. How's it going to change people's lives? How's it going to improve people's lives? Okay.、Uh, yes, that's what you really need to focus on. That、and、emotional. And then just、piece. a tiny quick. Yeah. Question, which is, for Facebook, do、mm -hmm. you feel like it's safe to still have a page and promote? Because I've been taking mine off because、mm -hmm. of all the things that are happening.、Yeah. So, with a business, is that like a safe thing to still do? We're still we're still using it at this point, but I I mean, there's news every day on it, right? I mean, I heard、um, Mark Zuckerberg this morning, and he's going up to you know talk to our governmental leaders. So there's a lot going on in news breaking every day on this.、They're, they are changing the privacy rules, so I, I think it's something we're all going to have to follow carefully, and maybe make our own decisions about it. But it's still a very powerful tool. We use it quite a bit in our our commotion and our Amazon Catalyst marketing and GIX because a lot of、uh, our target audiences that's where they are. You know that's where they get their information. That's where they hear about events, and and Twitter and and Instagram as well. But it's still such a critical, you know, place that people are getting their information. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we got one here. So one, what was the name of the service you mentioned earlier? Is it Meltwater? Meltwater, as in melting. Melt. Melt. Meltwater. Yeah,、um, yeah, it's a, it's a great database. I mean, you can search by you know, give me all the editors or reporters who wrote about this topic over the last six months, and it'll pull up. So it's very powerful. Okay, and then secondly,、um, I, I would have suspected some mention of Jeffrey Morris crossing the chasm. So, do you have any thoughts? Is is that you know, as a startup,、yeah. that's kind of what you're trying to do. You're, you're、yeah. trying to. Go from obscurity to mainstream. Yeah. So, any thoughts about that?、Um, I kind of feel like the things that I talked about are, are the, the first steps you would take in terms of. So, I'm taking more of that marketing focus. I don't know. Is, does that book also include bigger things rather than just marketing? Or well, it, it's obviously it's about technology adoption,、mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's it is marketing. You know,、mm -hmm. how, how do you build your awareness? So it's the,、mm -hmm. it's the Innovators, early adopters,、mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. late adopters,、mm -hmm. you know, laggards. Yeah. So it's you know target. So it breaks it up into different groups and how do you yeah. target? Yes. You know, how do you bring those groups in? Yeah. That's less my area of expertise, but I think that would probably go in the target audience space. And probably working with someone like Elizabeth Scallon, who runs our Commotion Labs here, and and really understanding what are those steps for your particular startup.、Um, but yeah, that would be less my area of expertise. Unless you have anything to add there. Yes,、uh, I can. There's、uh, probably I missed some information. I want、yeah. to ask.、Uh, I mean,、uh, when you want to、uh, just、uh, raise your funding, like first time, you have to share the idea to investor. But most of them care about、uh, not just the future vision, but they want to know you, how you quantify your your future vision. So it's、mm -hmm. like how to、uh, move on from. Uh, market strategy to、uh, like financial projection.、Mm -hmm. I mean, this 
how, how mm -hmm. can we do this process? Um, I think I would go back to this uh, this elevator or this uh, elevator pitch, and this is the one that would really be towards investors. And so um, there is a, a nine and ten. It talks about business model and your financial forecast. So this is the presentation where you would be hitting on those areas. Um, so yeah, that's of, of these you know thirteen different areas of content. You would need to include a couple slides. I mean, I'll, yes, that is a, a very important part that they're wanting they're going to want to know about your financial plans. And again, I'm more happy to share these slides after. That would be helpful. Yeah. Hi, I've got a, a quick question for the Amazon Catalyst program. Mm -hmm. So, can you sort of give a little bit of a uh, insight into what you would be looking for in terms of both pitching to you that, in terms of the size of a niche that someone might be going after? Um, in terms of market niche? Yeah. I'm, I'm building something for the tennis community, for example. You're building something for? The tennis community. Okay. So, the tennis players, captains, coaches, and pros, and there's fair number of them, it's a big niche, but uh -huh. it's still a niche. Uh -huh. Is that something that interests uh, Amazon? I, I, I would say, based on what you've shared, yes, because the, the program itself does not um, indicate any particular industry that it favors. Um, what it's looking for it are novel solutions to real problems. So we're looking for the big thinking, like the outside of the box thinking, the, um, the research that you've done in order to achieve the goals that you can articulate. Um, and then, of course, you also have to be able to express that in a way that captivates general public, not other tennis players, you know, captivate, or, or just the public would be interested in knowing, like, wow, that's a real novel idea. And it has to be scalable. That's another element of the current program. Others? And I just want to say the slides will be available if you have checked in. I need your email address to send them to you, so make sure if you haven't done that to do that on your way out, just as a plug. I think she's got one more question. Yeah. Um, so we don't have a website currently, and I've been reading a lot about marketing and that social media is more the way to go, and that actually a website is not as important. Hmm. Is that something you would? Like, should we be focusing on that first before the social media marketing? Well, I don't. I, I think it maybe depends on your company. I don't know your company, okay. and I don't know who it, you know who is your target audience. Um, and it, to me, if, if most of your target audience is on social media and that's where they're getting their information, then maybe that's a great place to start. I would think still at some point you're going to want a website to you know be able to point other people to. But if you can't do everything at once and you got to start somewhere, I would go where most of your target audience is living. And if that's where they're spending their time, absolutely. You can make a lot of traction just on social media. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have a question. Is uh, As a startup, you know, when we try to market our product, uh, do we need to think about our uh, competitors, especially, you know, those uh, well-established company, you know? Because, you know, I've heard a lot of stories about those companies even not uh, get to the market, but you know, just give an example. You know, when Microsoft get involved, then the company is totally gone. You know, yeah. Do you, is there any insight or consideration we need <coughs> to think about when we uh, marketing our product? Great question, and the answer is absolutely. Um, I would. I think I would start with the messaging piece and and making sure that you know what is your unique. Do you understand your unique value proposition, and what is it, and are you able to articulate it? clearly so that when you do if you do end up going against a bigger company you can explain very quickly and concisely but here's where we're different mm -hmm. here's what we offer uh, maybe it's the, maybe it's a lower price like what is the key benefit you know maybe it's something that Amazon already does but you're doing it better because of X Y and Z um, and so yeah I mean you should definitely do your research understand what competitors are out there but then be able to articulate how you're doing it better and or I, more cheaply, or whatever the benefit is. And can I piggyback Please? on that? Um, and so, <clears throat> if, for example, what uh, differentiates you from your competition, let's say, for example, it's your service. You provide better service, faster, friendlier. It's worth I including that or incorporating that in your marketing efforts. So, 
It might mean engaging your customers publicly on Twitter, having those conversations with potential customers where other people can witness, wow, you are really friendly, you are really f a fast responder. Um, so it's worth demonstrating that both in real time and then also reporting out on that within your marketing so that you're always hitting on what makes you different and a better, ultimately a better choice. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, Hi. We are a startup uh, formed by UW students. And uh, so when I was trying to pitch to the investors, they always have this question, why are you guys the right team? I mean, how could we even answer that? Nobody know who the right team is, right? <laughs> like, um, but you have to convince them you are the right yeah, team. Yeah, right. But I mean, this question always comes yes. up. You know, like, you guys are young. Why are you guys? Yes. Right team? And I think that goes back to the storytelling piece. Like, you have to have an awesome story where you you got to come up with like, what are those key points? Is it your experience? Is it your youth? Is it your age? Is it your other experience you've had in your classes, or is it some other experience you've had in your personal life? Sometimes even just a compelling story like, oh, I had you know, a, a brother who, or a sister who had this illness, and that's what really inspired me to get involved because I really, you know, to show your passion and your enthusiasm, that can be enough to show you're the right team. Honestly, a lot about what the right team is, is are you determined enough? A lot of startups, people just are not determined enough, and they want to see that you have the grit, the determination, the passion to see this thing through because it is not easy doing a startup. It's hard work, there's risk involved, and I think you gotta find a way to show them that you have that passion and drive and commitment to your idea. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah, um, and also, it's, it's worth, you know, when you, when you lose a deal or you, you lose an opportunity, it's worth following up and finding out why. That can give you a lot of insight into how other people see you because in order to have a successful business, you need to have your finger on the pulse of your customer, or your investor in this case, and know how they're viewing you, because oftentimes how you view yourself and how other people view you might not be completely aligned. Good question. I think we're good. Right. Well, we'll be around for a few minutes, you guys, if anybody wants to talk um, to us on the way out. And but thank you all for coming. Yay, thank you to Donna O'Neill and Gretchen Musgrove thank from you. Commotion. Thank you. Thank you. And please stay. We have the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic um, has a presentation on what is IP, and we'll get started in about five or six minutes. All right. Awesome. Yes, our IP program is one of our most popular entrepreneurial law clinic programs. Uh, we're starting today with what is IP. Uh, next week will be patent 101, the following week trademark 101, and copyright 101 on the following week IP licensing. It's a really good program. Uh, please stick around for just a few minutes while we switch out the presentation and uh, trade mics around.
So, I know, it's be fun. We'll all step out anyways afterwards. So. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to count five again? <laughs> I'll just do it just in case. One, two, three, four, five. Um, thank you all for staying, and uh, thank the World Affairs Council for coming in. That was fantastic. And uh, we are going to get started. Our IP series from the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic is one of our uh, favorite series is from them. This is being simulcast. I don't know if people told you about it. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In uh, so we may get we some got the questions release. from <laughs> Yes. Uh, please do, if you get a chance, repeat the question because it makes it, it, makes we'll it easier okay. for our folks who are okay. live streaming. Um, this is Dan Goodman and Max Fawcett. I did not check your last name. Perfect. Um, the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic is a fantastic program over at the University of Washington School of Law. Uh, law students in their second and third year can help advise startups at low or no cost? Uh, mostly no cost, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. So if you need to get a little bit of advice and they're overseen by attorneys in the field, um, so if you hit a snag and you need to go get advice from an advisor, then you're set to go. So it's a, it's a wonderful program and I, I recommended it to you all. Thanks very much for cool. coming. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you guys for being here today. Um, today we're going to talk about what is intellectual property. Um, first and foremost, it's going to be just a really basic introduction, an introduction to what it is. Um, and the three things that we're going to talk about today specifically are going to be trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. Um, later on, shameless plug for the next following weeks. Next week we've got a 101 on what is patents. So if you have an interest in patents, that will be discussed more thoroughly and completely next week. And then the week following, uh, there will be a, a much deeper dive into uh, uh, trademarks and copyrights. There we go. So just a quick disclaimer, none of this should be construed as legal advice. If you do have um, uh, any legal issues, we highly advise that you do seek legal counsel. <coughs> um, but again, another the shameless plug for the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic, to which we're a part of. Um, if you are qualified individuals, uh, you can actually enlist our services for free. The only thing you would have to pay for would be filing fees, for instance, if you're filing a trademark, um, things of those nature. And we don't just cover intellectual property. We do a wide gamut of things, which includes um, some tax issues, um, and as well as corporate issues, for instance, like you know, forming a, uh, your startup and uh, things like along those lines. Um, so as a brief overview, um, we're going to talk about, well, what is intellectual property? In its most basic form, it's, it, it's a, a creation of the mind, the intangible. Now, there are four different regimes for copyright, or not copyright, but for trademark, uh, IP. IP protection, pardon me. The first one is trademarks, which really, in essence, in a general sense, protects reputation. Um, the next is going to be copyrights, and that protects creative expressions that are fixed in a tangible medium, uh, in a medium. And then trade secrets, which protects confidential information. And then last, again, not discussed today, is patents, which is geared towards inventions. Um, and again, the date's down there, April 13th, uh, 2018. And these should be posted up, the slide deck, on uh, CoMotion's website um, in the following hours, I'm assuming, after this presentation. So we'll start with Max Fossett and the trademarks. I'll be doing trademarks. All right, nice to see you guys. All right, so trademarks. Um, they're just words, symbols, slogans, and sometimes packaging. I think we all have like innate understanding of trademarks. We just don't really like put some thought into it. So Microsoft, Coca-Cola, I'm loving it. Hershey Kisses. These are all these are all trademarks. Um, and they identify the source of the specific product or service, and it helps to distinguish your product or service from other people. So I mean, we could all walk into a store if we see a computer branded with that Apple. We know exactly where it comes from. Um, for walking down the street and someone's eating something. And it smells like a Big Mac. It's probably a Big Mac, right? All right. So these are the, the main things that it covers, but it also covers things like ha -ha, sound, color, fragrance. So if your significant other drops to a knee with a light blue box, you know it's coming from Tiffany's. Um, if you walk into an Apple store, they all look the same. So that's product packaging. That's trade dress. Um, the MGM Lion sound, if you hear that, you know the movie's going to come from MGM. So things like that. So we're going to do some trademark trivia first to start things off. If you could raise your hand and tell me if you know what any of those brands are associated with. In and out. In and out. All right, we got one. Nestle. Nestle. We got one other one. Levi's. Levi's. You guys are really good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make it too hard, but you guys aced it. All right. <laughs> yeah. So you guys already know. Without even the words needing to be there, you see the mark. You instantly know what it is. That's what trademarks are for. All right. So why do they matter? So obviously, the stronger your mark, 
um, helps to increase the value of your business. I mean, the, the trivia game we just played does that. You guys don't even have to see the words anymore. You just see the, you see the mark, you know what it is. Um, helps build goodwill in your business and brand awareness. Um, indicates the source, as we just talked about. Uh, helps guarantee the quality of your goods. Um, if, you, if you see a car with the Mercedes emblem, you're expecting a certain level of sophistication and quality in that product. Um, it also helps to create and maintain a demand for their product. That's more prevalent in fashion than anything else. Um, and then use it as a marketing tool. I mean, that's what slogans are for. I'm loving it. Just do it. All those kinds of things. Uh -huh. All right. So the process for getting a federal trademark is kind of broken down in these four steps. You have to select the mark first. Um, you have to clear that mark, apply for registration, and then you have to monitor your rights. Because if you don't monitor your trademark, your rights can be taken from you if you don't police your mark efficiently. So first things first, with selecting the mark. So marks are judged on a level, on a spectrum of distinctiveness. And so the more distinctive a mark, the higher the level of protection. So we're going to start on the left first. So generic marks don't get any protection at all and can't be trademarks. So for instance, if you have a carpet cleaning company and you name your carpet cleaning com company, carpet cleaning company, it's not going to count. It's way too generic. There's nothing that separates your business or service from anyone else. And you go up the spectrum a little bit to descriptive marks, stuff like American Airlines, or things like if you have batter to cook in, if you call it like fish fry or chicken fry, it's descriptive. You know what it is when you buy it because of the name. Those are not as um, distinctive. The ones, the, su the suggestive, arbitrary, and fanciful marks are inherently distinctive, so they're stronger. If you have a descriptive mark, you have to prove something called secondary meaning, which I'll talk about in a second. So then in the middle of the spectrum, we have suggestive marks, things like Burger King, where the name or the brand kind of suggests in your mind what it is, but you're not really sure. So for instance, something like um, Trek. So Trek implies like, a long journey, but you don't necessarily know that's going to be on a bike. And so that is a, su a suggestive mark. Arbitrary and fanciful marks are the most distinctive and therefore get the most protection. Uh, stuff like haagen and an apple when used in, con in connection with a computer. There's no connection there. That's why they're, they're the strongest. So something like Exxon. <coughs> Exxon, the, the word Exxon has no connection with the gas and energy services that it provides. Therefore, it's the strongest mark. Um, so as I mentioned before, the more distinctive a mark, the greater uh, level of its protectability. Um, suggestive, arbitrary, and fanciful marks are inherently distinctive. So secondary meaning is something, if you have a descriptive mark, you have to show secondary meaning. And secondary meaning is that you have to show in the minds of consumers that they associate your mark with whatever good or service that you provide. So showing secondary meaning can be difficult and expensive. A lot of the common ways you do it are surveys. You have to go out into whatever population where you're sending your mark or selling your wares and just survey people. Do they associate whatever your mark, whatever your brand is with whatever service that you're providing? So you can imagine that can get expensive if you're pulling a large amount of the population. So that's why we suggest you start with suggestive arbitrary fanciful marks because they're already inherently distinctive. You don't have to go through those hoops. Um, we already talked about all that. All right. So clearance. So once you've picked your mark, then you have to clear it. So the USPTO has a database called TESS where it searches through all the federally registered marks to make, or to make sure that the mark that you want isn't already registered, or if there's a mark that's already registered, that your mark is not confusingly similar to theirs. So this is uh, a limited database in that it only holds marks that have been registered federally. So as I'll talk about in a second, you can register both on the state level and the federal level. You can also have what are known as common law rights. So the test system only searches for those marks that are federally registered. So, but after you do that, you want to search for it. You also want to do a Google search, because as I mentioned, the test system only searches federally registered marks. So Google will help you find if anyone else, if you're making a shoe company, you decide to name it. I think Souls might be a little too generic, but if you named it Souls, you would want to do a Google search to make sure other shoe companies out there aren't using it, whether here in Washington, Oregon, anywhere else. Um, so trademarks are territorial. Um, if you intend to use them in any other countries, we have some agreements, uh, like the Madrid Protocol, where you can apply for a trademark here and then your trademark will be granted protection in the other four nations as well. But that's, we'll get into that in two weeks. <laughs> um, so application, there's three levels of protection. So as I mentioned, there's common law, state law, and federal law. So common law rights, the good thing about those is the moment you start using your mark in commerce, you have rights. So if you today go start a business, you have a brand, you start selling shampoo, whatever it is that, that, that you're selling with your logo, the moment you make a sale, you have protection. 
So, but the thing to point out is that protection is extremely limited. It's only, your mark is only protected where people know of your mark. So if you are a Washington business person who only sells in Washington, your mark is only known in Washington, you have no right to stop an Oregon business person from using their exact same mark for doing the exact same thing. Um, it's use it or lose it, obviously. Um, state law is the next step up. You get a little more protection, but again, it's limited to the state. So uh, if you are a small business owner and you only plan on selling in Washington, doing business in Washington, then you probably want to re rely on state law registration. It's less expensive, uh, it's quicker to get than federal re registration. As we'll go through later, federal registration can take a very long time. Um, and then federal law, it's more expensive, but you get protection across the entire United States. If I'm a business owner in Washington, but I've registered my mark fe federally, I can stop someone in, say, Rhode Island from using my mark or a mark that's confusingly similar to my mark from doing the same thing as me. So applications. The application process is pretty straightforward. Um, however, again, I recommend you hire counsel to do it for you because if you don't hire an attorney to do it for you, you can mess up the registration and it will just cost more time and money to fix it. So again, they, on the USPTO's web, web website, they have a quick little how-to guide on how to fill it out. Um, if you put in the study, you put in the work, you can probably learn how to do it yourself. However, I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> um, as we mentioned here, we found this online. Uh, trademark applicants who hire an attorney are 50% more likely to receive an approval if they, if they do, do it alone, um, especially when it comes to dealing with office actions and things like that. So when you register your trademark, you send it off to the USPTO, and then they'll sign an attorney to look over your application. They'll do a test search to make sure there's nothing else out there that's confusingly similar, and then they'll respond with an office action. Just an office action is basically a document that documents all the potential problems with, with, with your mark. So if they do a test search and they find two other marks that are identical or could be or could confuse a consumer, they're gonna flag that in the in the office action. If they think that your mark is too generic or too descriptive, they're gonna flag that in the office action. So the office action is just something that's sent back to you with any potential problems for, with, with your mark, with, with your registration. Um, file, filing fees, um, they're about 225 per class. So when you register your mark, you register under specific classes. So if you provide Let's say consulting services, that's one class. But if you also do other things, if you sell goods as well, that's another class. So you have to register per class, and it's about 225 to 275 per class. Um, so you can imagine that can get expensive if you do multiple things with your business, because you have to register under every single class. And also, if you do the registration by yourself and you don't know whether to register under a certain class, you can limit yourself and limit your business by not registering under the classes that you should have. Um, again, average law firm fees. Uh, I myself worked at a pretty small firm over the summer. It just really depends on where you go. If you go to some of the bigger firms, it's going to cost a lot more for uh, an attorney to do this for you. But there's some small boutique firms that kind of specialize in this, and that's the average cost. It'll, it'll, it'll cost you guys. It's not too bad. So this is the timeline. So as I, I mentioned before, the timeline is really long. So from the time you, uh, you do your mark, you do a search yourself, you do your application, you send it off. Before you get your first office action, it can be anywhere between three and six months. So because they have to assign an attorney, they have to, uh, you're not the only case they have, so it can take a really, really long time. So I know this is hard to see, but application filed, uh, the USPTO re reviews the apl application, and then the whole process, as a sense, can take anywhere between 18 to 36 months. Um, one of the cool things about the clinic that we do is if you guys come into the clinic, we have an agreement with the USPTO where for that first office action, we get an expedited delivery. So if you send off your application through the clinic, we get a response anywhere between two and three weeks. So it cuts off months and months of waiting. So if you guys are interested in that, I highly recommend you come to the clinic. Um, so the, the symbols you guys are allowed to use, I guess you've all seen these symbols on different marks and t-shirts. So basically what they mean is the giant R with the circle, can't use that unless your mark is federally registered. Uh, it's a crime to do that. If, if, you, if you're currently using a mark, with the giant R, I suggest you make sure that you're, fe you're federally registered, otherwise you would be in trouble. So the team and the SM are just stands for trademark and service mark. So if you have a state level re registration or if you're relying on common law rights, you can rely on the TM and the SM. You're saying that the TM doesn't matter, you can use it even with common law, so if you're using this happens sometime, make the name, you stick a TM on it, at least it's come after you? So yes. just to, re to, yeah, repeat, so to, to, to repeat the question to, here. To repeat the question is, if I don't have any 
if I haven't federally registered or state, but I start using my mark, can I use the TM symbol? Yes. Yes. Just to put other people on notice that this is my logo or my brand, whatever, I'm using it in commerce now. And then monitoring. So as I mentioned before, you have to be careful with your trademark rights because if you don't take care of them, if you don't monitor them, they can be taken from you. So some examples of this are for unauthorized use, genericide, and dilution. So I'll start with genericide since that's a little complicated. So genericide, think of uh, band-aids. When, when I say band-aid, you don't think of the specific brand band-aid. You just think of those little bandages you put over boo-boos, right? Or thermos. Uh, what is this really generic? Kleenex. Yeah, Xerox. Xerox. So these things aren't, they're, they're no longer named, yeah, they're, they're no longer named or used to describe the specific brand, but for the whole generic class of goods. So you have to be careful if, you're, if your brand slips into genericide, you no longer have protection for it because it's considered generic then. Um, dilution. Again, this is extremely prevalent in fashion. That's why they're super, super litigious about people using knockoff brands. Um, you want to make sure that no one else is do, doing a knockoff of your brand that lowers people's view of your brand. And then un unauthorized use, again. So if you're a Washington owner and you have all the registrations, but you know of someone somewhere else that's using a mark like yours or similar to yours in the same goods and services and you do nothing, then that's unauthorized use and you don't police your mark, your mark's going to be taken or your, your rights will be taken from you. Okay. So I hear you say do nothing. Yeah. Um, what's the statute of limitation or is there a statute of limitation from when you know what the first onset or your recognition of it? Okay. So the, do yeah. So when, so when I say do nothing, so the question was, uh, is there a specific time limit for when, when the moment you know someone's infringing your rights to when you have to act on it? Uh, I don't know. I usually just, I don't think there is a time limit. It's, yeah. It's the moment you know. I, I'm not an expert here, but I don't think there is. I don't think there is a statute of limitations. Okay. Yeah. So, so as long as you're using it in nothing. commerce, it's really kind of coming down to you have to prove that you are using it in commerce. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's all about when you find out. So for instance, if someone, yeah, someone in New York is using it, I have no idea. I can't do anything about it. But the moment I find it, if I do a Google search or if someone alerts me to it, at that moment I have to take action. Yeah. All right, so the infringement. This is complicated. This will be on the website. But um, when a court, if you send a cease and desist or if you choose to take someone to court, these are the factors that a court will look at when taking your mark next to their mark to determine whether or not they are similar. So I'll just I'll highlight a few. Um, the strength of the plaintiff's mark of your mark. So is your mark generic? Is your mark uh, inherently distinctive? Uh, the marketing channels for the respective goods and services. Do you both sell online? Do you do in-person sales? And let's do the defense intent in selecting the trademark. So they're going to ask the person that you want to sue or ask to stop, why did you choose this mark? If you chose this mark to kind of impinge on the goodwill of my mark, that's going to be a bad fact against you. And the court's likely going to assume that you're infringing the, the, the trademark. And this will all be up online so you guys don't have to worry about it. It is important to note, it is strict liability. So strict liability means your intent does not matter. So just because me, I'm in New York and I'm using a mark that's exactly the same to Dan's, just because I didn't intend to infringe, doesn't matter. I'm still infringing his mark. He has the right to send me a cease and desist letter to tell me to stop. And I will. And you definitely will. All right, <coughs> except for trademarks, I'm gonna give it all to Dan and cover copyright. <coughs> so copyrights. The Copyright Act really derives from the United States Constitution where we recognize that we really needed to provide protection for our authors and our inventors and creators, um, specifically Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. Just kind of give you a little background there. Um, so what is a copyright? <clears throat> well, I've tried laying everything out here on sort of like an element base, if you will, based on the law. It is an original work of authorship that is fixed in a tangible medium. It's really important to understand that copyrights protect the expression, not the idea. You have to have it fixed. Just because you have this brilliant idea about a book or a playwright or whatever it may be, you have to fix it. So going through, this, there's this original work of authorship. There, the originality requirement is actually a low threshold. Um, it's not really hard to meet. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it doesn't protect certain basic things like character archetypes. So the, the crime-fighting superhero, right, that's just too basic. It's not original enough. We can think of 
uh, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, you know, all these other things. But once you start adding more to the character itself, then we start leaning towards this sense of originality of this requirement. Um, you know, I don't have, there's no perfect answer about what is original and what is not. But if it's really basic, like the star-crossed lovers or, you know, the, the whatever it may be, something like that, so ger generic and broad, that's probably not going to be original. You need a little bit more than that. Um, works protected by copyright. It actually protects a, a wide variety of things. So literary works, which includes software for those who are engaging in some sort of uh, software startup. Um, musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes and choreographic works, pictorial, graphic and sculpture, motion pictures, audiovisual, sound recordings, architectural works. A pretty wide, broad spectrum. Oh, and some delayed pictures. <laughs> Um, so works that aren't protected by copyright. Well, first and foremost, let's go back to the idea of fixing it. Um, if you don't fix it, it's just an idea. So at that point, it's not protected. It needs to be fixed into some sort of a medium. So for example, um, in jazz improvisation, that alone by itself isn't going to be protected. You, gotta have, you have to do something to record it, whether it be through um, you know, fixing it to an, an MP3, putting it onto a CD. This, I mean, that, those are dying out pretty quick here, it seems. Um, you know, record it with your camera or your phone, something along those lines to fix it. Um, writing it down, something like that. Um, again, going back to the concept that ideas aren't protected, and those two are really hinged and tied together. Um, and there's something that we wanted to flag, useful articles. Um, the, the Copyright Act has this really <coughs> weird definition for it, which is, uh, something that has an intrinsic utilitarian function that is, not merely to, that is not merely to portray the appearance of the article or to convey informational. Bottom line, it's something that is inherently functional. Um, there are ways, so those things aren't copywritten, but if you can actually remove the design from this useful article, that you can copyright. So a good example of a useful article to which you can remove some sort of, like say, like a, an expression, if you will, would be a t-shirt. So you see people walking around with you know, the designs on your t-shirts. That's something that the design itself can be removed from the t-shirt and you can copyright. But the shirt itself is functional. I mean, it serves many purposes. You know, it covers you up, keeps you warm. Um, so things like that. Um, something that isn't, you can't remove. A good example is, is this even, oh, like the, the bike rack, right? So there, there is creative expression in that with the contours and the way that it's developed. But you can't really remove the expression and the idea from the bike rack. Um, if you were to copyright this expression, you would essentially be creating some sort of proprietary right um, into the bike rack. And that's not something that copyright does. That's something that, if you come next week, that's something that patents do. Um, so we channel it. Um, copyright channels um, and ideas and expressions into the appropriate um, IP regimes if you want to obtain protection. Um, there are certain rights that copyright bestows its owner. Um, for generally here, there's the right of reproduction. So to, you know, sending your song to press and making CDs and then going on the corner and, you know, giving your, your or, you know, something like that. Um, uh, the right of adaptation, so derivative works. A, a good example of this would be um, the new Star Wars, right? So we, we all know what Star Wars is, but now we be, we've created these new storylines and these new characters that are predicated on the original, you know, the first four, the first trilogy, four, five, and six. Um, so those adaptate, or even, um, you know, like the Superman, you see these like uh, Jessica Jones and these things like that. They're, they're derivative works of comic books, right? So they add more to it. Um, the right of distribution, so to distribute your CDs of the song that you made. Um, and then the right to publicly perform, to go out and to actually perform the song. Um, it's important that you know that these aren't just, these groups are, or sorry, these rights are individual. Um, they're not bundled together, they're, they're like a bundle of sticks. So if you wanted to, you could give away, you could license um, an individual right to separate individuals. So I, I could give uh, Max the right of reproduction and then I could give Marlo the rights to uh, to create derivative works based on my copyright. You, don't, you can kind of piece those things out and do with what you want. Um, is that for a fixed um, fix time? Or is there uh, the question, is it for a fixed time? We'll talk about the actual the duration of copyright coming in here. So we'll, well, you're ahead of the game here. We'll get you. <laughs> but, but I think if the question is whether you can get permission 
for different bundles for a fixed amount of time, yeah, yep. you can put you can put uh, terms on that, right? You would do so in a licensing agreement. You would say, hey, I'll There's like I, I want to give Marla the right to to you know the right of derivative works in my comic book or whatever it may be. I can go, we can go ahead and spell out terms and negotiate. Well, he'll get it for five years, right? And then after that, he can no longer make derivative works off of my copyright. Um, right. But you don't get the ability with that short term license to water it down and then take what that is and move it forward into something else. I'm, I'm not, is it? Take, take his idea. You've licensed it. You, we've agreed. You said five years was the term. Mm -hmm. Okay, five years. But during that period of time, they have usage of it. And then after that, they take elements of that and then move that into something else to leverage and move that forward. It, it's, you still, they still have part of the original. So I guess that's my question. Well, there, there are lots of things. I mean, it's, it, you can get super creative in how you license your intellectual property, your little twigs that you put out. Okay. Um, so if that's, if that's the, the scope of what you want to grant somebody, uh, you're going to give them the, the, the license to do that. You can do that. It wouldn't be wise to do that. I don't think that's a, a general practice. And usually what, you, what you're doing when you're doing these fixed term licenses is you're giving a, a limited scope permission mm -hmm. to do something for some period and only within the constraints of this and only within the constraints of this geography. And once it expires, it expires and everything reverts back to you. So. That's Oh, okay. okay. Question. Thank you. Dan. So to add on to another comment, it would actually be if you abstracted out certain elements that you wanted to keep going forward, right. that would be a derivative work, and that would not be allowed as a title. Okay. So that's an infringement. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm with you. Yeah. Perfect. That's what I do. So ownership and authorship. Uh, you can have multiple authors of a work. Um, if you do, it's called a joint, uh, uh, a joint work. You can also have what's called a work for hire. So you see these, for instance, um, in an employee working for uh, Microsoft, maybe developing some sort of a code. Um, if he or she is working within the scope of his employment and the employment agreement, uh, that would be something that Microsoft would have ownership in. There's also something I do want to flag for you guys, um, the independent contractor. Uh, this re this is, it's, it gets people. Um, because if they're an independent contractor, you need to make sure that in writing, they're releasing all copyright to you. Otherwise, they'll hold those rights. <coughs> so it would still be considered a work for hire, but just be, be very careful if this individual is classified as an independent contractor, know that you have to get it in writing. If you take anything away from copyright. <laughs> <laughs> Always put it in writing. Um, and then, of course, all assignments. So if you're transferring these rights that we talked about, all those need to be in writing as well. So keep that in mind. I don't want to touch on the difference between license and yeah. um, Duration. So as it stands right now, works created after January 1st, the protection lasts the life of the author plus 70 years. Um, beyond that extent, it falls <coughs> into what's known as public domain. So after that protection is lapsed, anyone can use it. Um, and then for anonymous works or works for hire, so somebody say who writes that inspirational quote, Anon, um, those individuals, 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever one is shorter. So those are things to keep in mind. I'm anticipating a question. No? Okay. And then there's, we, we wanted to flag this because it's kind of funny, the Mickey Mouse conspiracy. So it seems, you know, right when copyright protection is going to lapse for Mickey Mouse, it always seems that Congress extends the duration of copyright protection. So it just goes to show that whether it's true or it's not true, uh, you know, your lobbying dollars really go far. Um, and then some other limitations. So just because you have a copyright um, in some sort of a work, uh, know that there are limitations. Um, one of the ones that we wanted to flag here today is called the fair use doctrine. Um, it essentially grants an individual to sort of infringe on your rights. So something if it's used for educational purposes, or uh, one of my favorite is for parody. So for instance, does everyone here know who Weird Al Yankovic is? OK. So his songs, all of them, I mean, he is he's completely infringing, but it's in a parody, uh, for parody purposes, which uh, copyright has said that's actually OK. So just be aware that if you do see some sort of infringement on your right, it may be acceptable under the fair use doctrine. Um, but again, there's factors that the courts consider as to whether it is fair use. Question. Is there a definition around parody? Like, does it have to have, be like, have humorous intent? Or is it just like some you know, 
version of the original? I, I think you have to be, you have to take aspects of the copyrighted work and then make a comment on that work. If it's parody, it's going to be funny. So yeah, you can't just take it and say, I'm making a parody of this and it's the exact same thing. You have to be changing something, adding so something to it. That's not funny. And that would also be acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, trade secret. So this is kind of the flip side to patents, which again, shameless plug, come back next week, uh, and patents will be discussed uh, in depth. So what is a trade secret? Well, I, again, try to break it down into four different elements here. It's information that has independent economic value from being kept secret that is not readily ascertainable by proper means, and the secret owner has made reasonable efforts under the circumstances to keep it secret. This is language that's pulled directly from what's called the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Each state has its own version of the act, and there's also a federal act, which is the um, Defend Trade Secrets Act, which is essentially mirrors this exact same language. Um, so this just kind of gives the, there's a little bit more nuances when it comes to the state of Washington. For instance, one of the things, the information has to be novel, right? Um, so some states might add a little bit more or take a little bit less, um, but just to keep that in mind, the flag for you guys. So some examples of trade secrets, um, you know, the Big Mac special sauce, Google's search algorithm, one of the more famous ones, uh, the Coca-Cola formula. I think it's only two people know the formula and they can't both be on the same plane. At once, yeah. Um, yeah, at the same time. So that it just, just goes to show. Um, KFC. Uh, pardon? I said KFC. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Secret blend, man. Right, yeah. <laughs> Proprietary. Um, so what type of information are we talking about? Well, there's a, a pretty broad list here. Um, and if you please come back next week, and, and this will really make a little bit more sense than when I'm talking about the significant overlap with patents. There's, it, it's basically directly the exact same thing, um, but different types of protection. But it covers formulas, patterns, um, devices, techniques, processes. These are the type of things that trade secret protects. Um, first and foremost, the secret must actually be a secret. If it's information that's known to the general public, 2 plus 2 equals 4, there is no way you are going to obtain a trade secret on that equation. It's just not going to happen. Um, it has to be something that's not generally known to the public. And then, of course, it has to derive independent economic value. So some questions that you might want to ask yourself, does it really derive independent economic value, is uh, does it give um, me a competitive edge in the market? Is it something that I want my competitors to have? Is it a pricing model that I'm using? Is it a customer list that I have? Is it a specific way that I'm, is it Coca-Cola? Is it a secret formula that people really thoroughly enjoy of, a, of a, a, a cola? Something along those lines? If so, you probably have independent economic value from having it being kept away from the market or the generally known public. Um, uh, again, being if the formula for Coca-Cola were released, then you can imagine RC Cola, Pepsi, all these other companies would all of a sudden start making Coca-Cola and would make their own brand. And at that point, you know, the value of a Coca-Cola, or because it's, it, it's the entire business, it would just plummet. So when I, I mentioned previously uh, uh, that it's, uh, uh, there are not reasonably ascertained through proper means. Um, it's a little bit of a heightened standard, but one of the things that I want you to take away from this is that just because it's a trade secret and it is secret, there are ways that actually individuals can obtain your trade secret and through proper means that it's acceptable and you would lose your protection. So these are the proper means. So for instance, by discovery by independent invention. So say uh, I'm in Washington and Max is in New York and we both come up with the same cola formula. Um, that's okay. That's, that's, he, he hasn't infringed upon my trade secret. He just lost the trade secret too. Another way that you see is reverse engineering. So if we all as a collective group decided we were going to take all the Coca-Cola at the back, um, we were going to you know, taste test and try and figure out exactly what the formula was, we could reverse engineer it. At that point, that's okay. Um, we can do those types of things. Uh, things that are improper though, they should be pretty self-explanatory. Theft, you know, breaking into someone's office and obtaining the Coca-Cola formula. Um, another one, <laughs> espionage through electronic or other means. There's a case, uh, E.I. DuPont, where they were building this, uh, this facility which was proprietary to them. And there was a competitor that flew over with this small little Cessna and was taking pictures. 
And they were like, oh, no, no, it's fine. We, when we were just, it was clearly open to the public. You know, we flew over and they said, no, 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 no. And this will tie to the next slide. They said, that's, that's, not, that's not proper. That's espionage. That's not fair. You haven't actually obtained it through proper means. Um, and then, of course, breach of duty or ND, uh, uh, a non-disclosure agreement. So um, that being said, that a non-disclosure agreement, just in case we're not aware of what that is, it's an agreement where parties will agree to keep information confidential. Uh, question? If you just to like, so, repeat so the question. Is, is it okay to say publicly there's an NDA between A and B, or is that also protected by the agreement? So the question is, it, is it okay to publicly disclose whether there's an, an there NDA there's or non-disclosure agreement. agreement between the two? Yeah. Uh, so the NDA agreement itself could specify, no, this agreement itself should be kept secret, secret okay. um, or not. Um, generally speaking, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, I Marlon. No, that's, I mean, that's exactly what I would say. I mean, we, we do have NDAs like that where we say, um, you know, anything that we disclose to you, including the, the existence, yeah, of, the, yeah. Yeah, including the existence of this relationship, that is confidential information or this agreement is confidential. Okay. Right. Question? Thank you. Uh, I'm ready to jump into, dive into the pool there. That, that little segment, the last part you mentioned, so that can be without the official document, could that be in the body of the email? Like if you're engaging with someone just prior to anchoring a deal or coming to some formal arrangement, um, could that, uh, language be in the body of an email which would protect in lieu of them not doing business with you or taking it and going somewhere else. Call me, call me. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. <laughs> so so your the best advice is going to be to have a have a have an actual agreement, a signed agreement. That's that's your best advice. But um, courts will an agreement is not defined as something that's in writing. An agreement is an agreement. There, of can be made look orally. At the substance, and you can have yeah. an oral agreement. You can, but but the, the difficulty is proving it, right? It's your word against theirs. If you have an email, that is more proof. That's that is a written written document, and then you can kind of back into how that they, they did that agreement. So you could offer that in evidence. It's just the the best evidence for an agreement is a written Isn't contract that's signed. Sure. And then, so what's the best way then to finesse the uh, NDA when folks are on the line and don't really want to commit to signing one? I mean, Repeat you know, question. just demand to have it anyway. I, yeah, I, so I, I would be careful about using the term finesse, right? You want to be very clear with, with, with your counterparty what you're agreeing to. And oh, it's and not I'm like you're- on my end. I'm well, talking about on their end I'm, to obtain what they need from me. So I'm just saying to finesse the, the conversation to move it forward, and they have no intentions of, and then I'm still, that, that's why I was talking like about to, the email. To try to get them to agree to, to keep your information confidential, Absolutely. is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think you just gotta be very clear, no finesse about it, but very clear. This is, this I consider this to be my confidential information, my trade <coughs> secret, and I want, I want to make sure that you agree to keep it confidential. Um, you may have an NDA, you say I want you to sign this NDA, okay. or you know if you're gonna if you're gonna go to the email, then you spell out specifically what it is. I would I would get legal advice to help you come up with the language. And if you, if you feel that they're pr if they're prying for information and you don't have an agreement, I mean it's the the best way to keep something secret is to never tell anyone. So um, if you know it's it's always best to have something like that in writing, especially with you know the markets being so competitive and some people you just sometimes you don't know who you're dealing with across the table. And their negotiation tactics may not be as friendly as yours are. Right. Um, so, yeah, hence the word finesse, not on my Yeah, head. no, yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah. no, yeah. So some people are really crafty and they, yeah, they tuck things into agreements that you just don't necessarily know. So, um, um, but again, another shameless plug for the clinic if there's uh, things like that's that's something within the scope that the clinic does. So, if, yeah. um, if you know, that's something that you need assistance in. Um, with your business, please, again, these, the slide, as we mentioned before in the disclaimer, we have all the information, please apply. We would love to see you. Um, moving on, reasonable under the circumstances to keep it secret. Um, reasonableness is not a one size fits all. Um, the language under the circumstances implies that sometimes, you know, just be, going back to the, the, the espionage with taking pictures of the facility, 
one of the things that the court said there is like, well, what are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to build this giant contraption to try and hide the facility and then they could build it and then tear it down? That's just so unreasonable. Um, you know, there's, there's no absolute definition of what reasonable is. It's a really squishy word. Um, but know that, um, you know, if it's pretty easy to keep it secret, if it's a customer list and, you know, you have employees, for instance, that are going to be seeing this, letting them know this is confidential information. Um, we're going to keep this in a locked file cabinet. Um, certain things are going to require heightened standards of uh, protection. And, of course, it's going to be within your means, too. So, you know, we can all think that a small startup in a garage is not going to be held to the highest standard that Microsoft, for instance, would be when it comes to like their source code or something along those lines. Um, and I've listed up here some uh, you know, policy and protection strategies, some things that companies should really implement. Um, you know, ensuring that there's mechanisms to identify, assess, and manage trade secret assets and any risk of trade, sec uh, trade secret theft. Um, appointing the right people to develop the procedures, um, especially if you know, you know somebody, is, if it's code or whatever it may be, and you know the risks and where you're vulnerable on your server, what it may be, it's really nice to make sure that you're pulling those individuals in because you know, the, the best people who would know how to steal it would be the ones who are making it. Um, and then you know, making sure that there are non-disclosure agreements in place, um, developing the procedures, including monitoring, auditing, and the, taking corrective action as needed, and then going down to the bottom, actually enforcing it. If you're not enforcing it, well, the courts are going to say, well, that, too bad. You snooze, you lose. You may have had a trade secret, but you sat on your hands, and you knew that these things were flying out your door. And so just because you called it a trade secret, you didn't really take any protective measures. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, and then some pros and cons. There's no filing required once you've met those elements. Uh, it's instant, and it could possibly be indefinite. Um, like and Coke. then, pardon? Like Coke? Yeah, like Coke. Um, and then, of course, if it's something like Coke, for instance, going back to that, it keeps competitors in the dark. Um, you're not where you'll see next week where patents, in order for you to get uh, protection, uh, you have to disclose the information to the government. And then they, in return, they give you a limited uh, uh, duration of protection, where in this case, you're not disclosing anything, you're keeping it secret. So nobody, not the general public, has no clue what you're working on or what you're doing. Um, some cons, uh, you know, once the information is generally known, it's no longer a trade secret. Um, and then the cost of maintaining the secret could <coughs> potentially be pretty high, depending on what it is, who you are, what you're doing, and the measures that actually need to be in implemented in order to keep it secret. Um, so that wraps it up. Do we have any final questions or thoughts or? Things to share? Funny jokes. I'll take anything this one. No? Okay. No? Well, thank you guys for cool. being thank here. And again, I want to reiterate too, the slide deck should be up there. If you, if you have any interest or any, um, any, anything going on with your current business or startups, please apply to the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. Uh, we would be excited to, to, to have you join us and to provide some assistance. And again, it's the, the legal work is free. The only thing that you would have to do is pay for any filings, so whether it be for trademark reg registration or something along those lines. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. Oh, one more. One question regarding the uh, TM versus the SM. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so you use the TM. Oh, let me see. So the question was the difference between the TM and the SM. The TM you use for a trademark, the SM means a service mark. So if you're providing a service, you want to use the service mark. If you're providing a good, you want to use the TM. Yeah. But until that time, you can use the team and the SM. Okay. Yeah. The R is just to put everyone on notice that your mark is protected on the federal level, so they can't okay. infringe. And then can you help me please with um, images, like pictures and photos, like watermarks? Sp for, watermarks for, for, for copyright or trademark? <laughs> that would be the question. <laughs> <laughs> for, for pictures. So I take a picture of this banner here. Mm -hmm. How do I protect it and make sure that um, if I need to use it or duplicate it, that it's within the scope of what I have? Okay, so the question is, if you just take a random picture, how do you protect right. the, your rights in that picture? So as Dan mentioned with copyright, so if I go out and I take a picture of anything, the moment you do it, it's fixed, so you have all the copyrights that Dan talked about, the right of reproduction, the right of distribution, and all those other rights. Okay. So at that moment, you can exercise any of those rights. So you, d depending on what the picture is, obviously, you can stop someone else from using that exact same picture, from distributing it, from turning it into posters, from all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
you just have to make sure that what you're taking a picture of isn't protected by copyright itself. So like the Space Needle, for instance, they're very peculiar about people taking pictures or using that image on anything. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then so then the, I wouldn't need necessarily a watermark is what you're saying. For whatever it, the for image whatever is. Mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't need one. Depending on what it is, you might want one. Um, yeah. That's where I'm, I'm trying to get in that lane and just do it just because mm -hmm. I don't have to think about it or have, have it come up later. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Max. Mm -hmm. For the clinic?